Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Let's be a little malicious and show up that YouTube algorithm by hitting the like and subscribe buttons down below. That said though, our first story of the day is by Love the Yankees, another entitled parent. My sister assigned the following homework problem to her fourth grade class. Mary can swim at a rate of two meters per second. How long will it take her to swim to a raft 10 meters from shore? One of the parents sent her an email reminding her that in America, we do not use the metric system. She demanded that all math problems use normal units. My sister replied with a new problem for the kid to solve. Mary can swim at a rate of 2 yards and 6.740157480314949 inches per second. How long will it take her to swim to a raft 10 yards, 2 feet, and 9 point a lot of numbers inches from shore? Listen, we take great pride in freedom units. If there's one thing America is proudly stubborn about, it's that empirical system. You look at the map of the world that still uses the imperial system, and it is exactly like three and a half countries. There's 195 countries in the world for reference. What do you guys prefer? Do you prefer the metric system, or are you a stubborn imperial freedom unit lover? Let me know about you guys in the comments down below. Our next story is by Raisin to Live. Yes, it is illegal, but you told me to do it. When a planning and placement team meeting is held on a student and the team decides they need testing, it's the special ed teacher's job to give them a one-on-one -on -one achievement test. Write a rough draft IEP, up to 20 pages, and a full academic report detailing the results. Well, my principal lived to push through these students so as to make her teachers happy that they would get some extra help. Unfortunately for the SPED teacher, me, that means each takes up to at least a week of work, which means we can't see our caseload in the meantime. When the planning and placement team signs consent for testing, we have 45 days to complete it and hold the second meeting. My principal, as I mentioned, likes to keep her teachers happy, so last year she pushed through 14 students that I had to test, which I did, not taking lunch or breaks for weeks in order to meet the deadlines. When she wanted to meet to review how I was meeting the goals for my students for my evaluation, I had to inform her that I never saw them. 45 days without seeing a SPED teacher. What? That's illegal. We'll be meeting and you'd better bring your union rep. You have to provide their hours. Sorry, but if I saw them and did all the testing, I'd be working a 12-hour day. No can do. I had the documentation, the reports, and the union rep to back it up. Two students qualified for services. I just hate that these kids aren't getting the proper care they need. Why play games when it comes to special education? Gross misconduct of management and job responsibilities led to all these kids missing out on hours that they deserve to have. This next story is by Deny Conformity. Get approval for working on anything? Okay, if you insist. So I work as a business intelligence analyst in a healthcare environment. Our team leader can charitably be described as work shy. This is a person that used to pull up a couple of seats and go for a nap in the office. While asking some of the team to keep a lookout, first time it happened, I thought, this is unusual, but they must have some health issues, so I'll let it slide. After it's happened a few times, you're not really sure how you raise it with HR without seeming complicit. Anyway, the hospital is meant to be changing PAS systems, and we have to completely rewrite a mountain of reports to work on the new system, with a big problem that the new data warehouse is almost non-existent. The team leader decides we're spending too much time working on current state reporting and not enough on future state reporting. The team leader's response to this is we need to seek approval for doing any reporting work on the current system. We're in the middle of COVID and we've got information requests coming in from everywhere and these get added to our task manager and no one is allowed to work on anything that hasn't been approved. Within a couple of weeks, we're mostly sitting around twiddling our thumbs and the list of outstanding requests is growing by the day. We've got a lot of requests being escalated to the COO. We can't work on the future state reporting because the new data warehouse is a constantly changing mess. After a couple of weeks of this, we get an email that effectively says, I can't keep up with all the requests coming into the department. I wish I could say this was a happy ending and we all got to work properly. Unfortunately, things got doubled down on. This team is put under intense scrutiny and the constant micromanagement starts. Then a comment is made to our line manager, screw them, if they're unhappy they can find new jobs. He passes this on, and within three months, most of the team have either left or handed in their notice. 
the department has effectively imploded. The malicious compliance is either following the requirement to get sign off for everything from someone too lazy to sign anything off or follow their advice and get new jobs. This kind of just reminds me of that saying of people don't quit bad jobs, they quit bad managers. You're going to be overbearing, micromanaging, and pushing work upon work upon work upon already existing pressures elsewhere? They were willing to triple down if they could, but everybody would probably quit by then. This next story is by Dimitri V. Make me do your safety inspection? Okay. I commented another thread about a QA inspector getting reprimanded for finding too many quality problems reminded me of this. Long ago, I worked in the back warehouse of a home decor store. Think tacky vases and such. Only cheaper and worse quality junk than you're imagining. No, still worse than that. Little further. There you go. Anyway, the store manager was all about the status quo. If he was at his desk playing solitaire, things were good. If he had to do anything, they weren't. In his words, if he had to do work, it's because someone else screwed up. One thing that disrupts the status quo is safety issues. Why, that might make a manager have to reach for a form. Or even get up from his desk. Fortunately for him, the warehouse supervisor, who was a personal friend of his, which was the only reason such a useless waste of employment could have any title other than fired, was responsible for the safety back there. So safety issues were well in hand, which is to say, ignored and dismissed. Naturally, there were many safety problems. One of them being that boxes were often stacked too close to the fire sprinklers. One day, I saw boxes actually leaning against them. I don't know how fragile those little glass fuse things are, but in addition to not wanting to die in an inferno, I also didn't want to be drenched in filthy water if someone jolted the shelf. So I said something to the supervisor, not knowing that the manager happened to be walking by behind me. That meant that something might need to be done. Gasp. Naturally, the supervisor took responsibility and called the meeting to make sure everyone is aware of the law and not to do that. Just kidding, he made me move the boxes. But that wasn't enough petty punishment, so he also made me responsible for the monthly facility safety inspections. The safety inspection is a full building walkthrough and check of equipment and anything safety related fire exits, ladders, pallet jacks, and so on. Or if you're a spineless half-witted beneficiary of nepotism, lazily walking around holding a clipboard and your phone, only paying attention to the latter, probably forwarding lame jokes to friends you think you have, and pencil whipping the safety part. He saw it as pointless busy work and undoubtedly thought it would be the same for me. But here's the thing, if you sign off that something faulty is okay, then there's an incident and someone gets hurt, you can be responsible because you signed off on it. Well, I'm not about to have that fall on my shoulders. You want a safety inspection? I'll perform a safety inspection. I tested every emergency light in the building. Half of them were dead. Fire extinguishers, not service at the required intervals. Noted. More boxes close to fire sprinklers, documented with pictures. Inadequately stocked first aid kits, written down. No safety pins on pallet racks? That's not up to code. Shot wheel bearings on hand trucks? Why, a wheel could catch and tip a load on someone? We can't have that. I asked co-workers for anything they knew of. Thanks, I hadn't seen that broken weld on a railing. Supervisor Boy's inspections took him a few minutes. Mine was close to two hours. The second best part of all this? The safety inspection reports went to corporate. A smarter idiot might have wanted to check mine first, but it never occurred to the useless supervisor. Even he would have noticed the supplemental pages stapled to mine. Corporate sure did. And the best part? Responsibility for fixing every single issue fell on him and on the manager to make sure it was done. As a bonus, even they knew better than to retaliate against me right after I documented safety issues in writing to corporate, and because it would look bad to pencil whip documented issues or not take care of them before the next inspection, Supervisor Boy had a lot of work to do that month. For some reason, he didn't want me to do the safety inspections anymore. I sure wonder why OP was never made to do the safety inspections anymore. Maybe it was because OP did too good of an actual job inspecting things. I'm sorry, but if I was OP and I did that inspection and found all of these things around, I'd be a little bit of a whistleblower and tell everybody, be careful, this place is a death trap. Bad cartwheel falls off, the load tips over into the glass, 
catches on fire, fire extinguishers are expired and not serviced and don't work, the lights are dead in the exit door so you can't find it amongst the smoke, need I go on? And our final story of the day is by DM15, ask me to buy $2600 worth of Pokemon cards? Okay, sorry for a bit of backstory but here we go. First of all, I live in Japan, where Pokemon is still very much a huge deal. Cards, merchandise, anything really. Just like the rest of the world, card scalping is a huge thing. Personally, I feel the game is for kids and do my best to allow kids to enjoy it, etc. I also despise scalpers and only ask people to pay what I paid with no markup. I recently offered my services to a group on Facebook and was flooded with people who wanted Japanese cards. Okay, no problem. I can help. So I start helping people when in pops Mr. Ran. Now, Mr. Ran introduced himself to me as a card shop owner who wanted 20 to 50 boxes of the latest set. Retail is around 50 US, secondary markets around 70 US. I say, sure, why not? And start searching for boxes in his price range. I found around 20 or so, asked several times, are you sure this is what you want? Is the price okay for you? I'm going to buy them now. All the while he vehemently says, yes, please. I'll pay you once you've bought them. Now, call me naive, but I did, to the tune of $2,600. When I told him the final cost with shipping, he immediately said, Hey man, do you have references? I haven't seen you in the group before. I want security. I'll give the money to the admins as an escrow and you'll get it once the product arrives. Now, I've actually just spent $2,600 on cards I don't need or want, with money I don't actually have, and now this guy wants to not pay me until they arrive. A two to three week wait. Yeah, nah. So I give him way too much information, my address in Japan, Facebook slash Instagram, etc. Not enough. I tell them we actually share common friends on Facebook. Not enough. I tell them names of people who I'm currently selling to. Not enough. I was cold sweating. I'm about to be thrown for $2,600 under the bus by someone who reached out to me and despite several checks, refuses to back down. I finally said, mate, do you want these or not? No thanks, too many red flags, sell to someone else. Right? Cue malicious compliance. I google this card shop, turns out it's competing with another shop just down the road. I message the owner, he's also looking for the same cards and will pay the same price. Again, I'm not selling these at a markup, selling at resale market price, and tell him the only condition is that he sells the boxes for $5 less than Mr. Ran. Done deal. So now, Mr. Ran has to deal with the competing card shop getting 20-something boxes of the latest and most wanted stock and underselling him. All because he wanted to take advantage of someone trying to help him out by refusing to pay until cards in hand. This of course would mean a situation like, I'm sorry man, number of boxes were damaged in transit, I'll only pay you so and so less, etc. If there's any extra to the story, I'll update it. Also, please remember, scalping sucks. If you're going to resell, at least make the price the same you'd be happy to pay. I got a DM asking why I wasn't more spiteful and why I didn't go for revenge. Well, I'm not doing this to be well off, so if you didn't want them, I could find someone else. Just moving 20-something boxes within a month just seemed hard. Also, many small businesses are struggling worldwide. I'm not about to make the guy go under purely because of this. I doubt the other guy will stick to his $5 off, but if he does, I guess that's revenge. I think what I really appreciate about OP here in this situation is that they're doing all this just for the love of it. Just to try and make these things more accessible to kids who obviously will enjoy it a lot. Seeing the situation go down, you have to feel no remorse for Mr. Ran at all. In fact, it kind of leaves me feeling like I hope that competitor does a little bit better than him because... You can kind of tell that Mr. Ran was just trying to be like a scumbag and not only get a great deal already from OP but totally rip them off too. The only thing that would have been better is telling Mr. Ran that his competition got what he was too scared to properly pay for. Maybe if Mr. Ran tried to renegotiate, you could get a little bit of a premium from a jerk like that. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. 
Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.